I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. It is a great honor, and also for organizing this conference in such a beautiful place. So I will be talking about the analytic conformal bootstrap. So what will this talk be about? This talk will be about conformal field theories in dimensions higher than two. There are many reasons to study conformal field theories. They, for instance, are very relevant for physics. They enter in the asymptotic regimes of QFT. They also explain and they enter in condensed matter, in the description of critical points, etc. They have also a very beautiful interplay with mathematics through representation theory, the Langslax program, etc. Many important theories are conformal, like N equals 4 super Mills, the 3D icing model, critical ON models, etc. And they appear everywhere in dualities in a string and gauge theory. The only problem with conformal field theories is that they are a little bit hard to study. For instance, conformal field theories in general do not have a Lagrangian description. Now, if you have a Lagrangian theory, you can in principle compute observables in this Lagrangian theory by doing a Taylor expansion around a small coupling constant G. And there is a systematic way through Feynman diagrams to compute this terms here, here, etc. But generic conformal field theories don't even have a small coupling constants. Furthermore, we also don't have the luxuries that we have in two dimensions. We have no Virasoro algebra, we don't have a finite number of primaries, and in general, in higher dimensions, representation theory is less powerful. In spite of all this, progress can still be made. And one of the ideas that let us to, that allow us to make progress, is the idea of the conformal bootstrap. The conformal bootstrap consists in resorting to consistency conditions. Since we don't have a Lagrangian, we use what we can. And then the idea is to use consistency conditions, such as conformal symmetry, properties of the OPE, unitarity, and crossing symmetry. I will review all this uh, uh, later on. This idea was very successfully applied to two dimensions in the 80s by these people here, and 25 years later, it was successfully implemented in higher dimensions. This was the starting point of an impressive numerical revolution, which is still going on. The purpose of this talk is to tell you how to get analytic results for conformal field theories from bootstrap ideas and consistency conditions in general. While the numerical bootstrap offers you results for a small, for operators with a small or a smallish spin and twist, dimensions minus a spin, if some of the quantum numbers are large, then one can do some kind of analytical approach and one can obtain analytical results. Depending on whether the spin is large for finite twist, or the twist is large for finite spin, or both of them are large at the same ratio, we have made progress over the last few years in all these three directions. In addition, there has been many other approaches to obtaining analytic results in conformal field theories that would need an extra axis here, so I won't have time to review them. But those include large central charge limit, solvable protected subsectors, crossing in Melina space, large global charge, average null energy conditions, and also we have seen, we have witnessed great progress in two dimensions. Hopefully, we will hear more about some of this in, in the next talks. Our plan will be basically to start with the Lincoln bootstrap to start in this region and show how this can be expanded to all other regions. So that's what, what we are going to do. And that's why I have decided to call this talk analytic bootstrap rather than Lycon bootstrap, because we will extend to all other regions. So which kind of analytic results will you get today, or at least will you get today from me? You will get results for operators with a spin 
in a generic conformal field theory. And the kind of operators that you can have in mind are, for instance, these two, sort, these two kind of operators. One is denoted by double trace or double twist, and this is denoted by single trace. In these kind of operators, we take one scalar operator of the theory and take another one and act with a change of derivatives on them such that this combination is a primary. This is called a double twist because it's composed by two other operators, or double trace sometimes, although there is no trace here. On the other hand, if you have a gauge theory, you can also consider single trace operators, where you take the trace of a scalar operator, a lot of derivatives, and another scalar operator. So what we will do, we will study these kind of operators, and then we will study their scaling dimension delta as a function of the spin. For large values of the spin, as a Taylor expansion in 1 over L. So these sort of expansions. And then I will show you how to obtain analytic results to all orders in 1 over L, resorting only to consistency conditions. And the methods I will describe will be valid for vast families of conformal field theories. I hope the plan is clear. So let me start with the basics. Very basics. So all conformal field theories have in common the conformal algebra. The conformal algebra is generated by scale transformations. If you make your space twice as big or half as small, then the physics is the same. In addition, you have the Poincaré algebra generated by translations and rotations and special conformal transformations, which I cannot attempt without dying, so I won't do it. Now, a specific conformal field theories may also have extra symmetries, but I want to keep this discussion as general as possible, so these extra symmetries will not play much of a role in what I will say. So what I will say will be true for generic conformal, for generic conformal field theories. So. The main ingredient of a conformal field theory are conformal primary local operators. These are, are operators evaluated at a point which are eigenfunctions of the dilatation operator and are labeled by the eigenvalue of the dilatation operator, which is called the conformal dimension, and their Lorentz spin L. In addition, for a given primary, we have all the tower of descendants, which is simply obtained by acting with derivatives on these primaries O. A very beautiful property of conformal field theories is the fact that operators form an algebra. In English, what this means is that if you take two of these operators and put them together, you can express that product as an infinite sum of local operators that you can see on the right-hand side. Now, this infinite sum includes both primaries and descendants, but a beautiful property of conformal field theories is that all the coefficients of the descendants are fixed once you fix the overall coefficient of the primary. This is due to conformal symmetry. So here you see that there are two data that um, characterize the conformal field theory. On one hand, we have the scaling dimensions delta i for all the primaries of the theory, that's called, it, that's called the spectrum of the CFT. And then we have these coefficients, which are called OPE coefficients, C, I, J, K, for any triplet of primaries, I, J, and K. This is sometimes denoted as the CFT data. The main observable are correlation functions of these primary operators. It is a classic result that in a conformal field theory, two and three-point functions, the spatial dependence of two and three-point functions, is fixed by conformal invariance. And we see here the formula for scalar operators. So they are, these two and three-point functions are completely fixed in terms of the OP coefficients, Cijk, and the scaling dimensions 
of these uh, operators. For this talk, we will focus in the first, in the simplest, dynamical non-trivial quantity. This quantity is the four-point function of four identical scalar operators. Conformal symmetry doesn't fix the four-point function in this case, but it tells us that this function, this, four point, this correlator, is a function of two variables, u and b, divided by this weight factor. Where here, u and b are these two conformal cross ratios. They are some combinations of the coordinates, x1, x2, x3, x4. So this is the correlator that we will study, and from studying this correlator, we will try to extract analytic information about generic conformal field theories. Now, this correlator has two very important properties, two properties that will be very, very important for us. The first property is that it admits a conformal partial wave decomposition. Indeed, you can start from the correlator and you can consider the OPE of these first two operators and these two operators, and then you can write down the full correlator as a sum over intermediate operators present in this OPE of O with O. In formulas, what this means is that this function, GUB, can be written as a sum over conformal primaries in the present in, in the present in the OPE of two external operators, and each conformal primary, the contribution from each, each conformal primary, is proportional to the square of the OPE coefficient, one OPE coefficient arising from here, and another OPE coefficient arising from here, and then a function which is called a conformal block. This function, the conformal blocks, basically, for a given primary, they take into account the contribution of all the descendants of that primary. And this function is a function which is, it may be ugly, but is fully fixed by conformal symmetry. It only depends on the dimension and the spin of the intermediate primary, and of course, the number of dimensions and the cross ratios u and b. Also, for reasons that will become clear very soon, we have chosen to single out the contribution of the identity operator. The second property, which will be very important for us, is crossing symmetry. If we are considering the correlator of four operators, and these operators are identical, then it shouldn't make a difference if I exchange two of them. In particular, this implies a relation between GUV and GVU. If you use that together with the decomposition before, basically what we are saying is that the composition, sorry, is that the decomposition along this channel, one, two, goes to three, four, should be the same as the decomposition along this channel. 2, 3 goes to 1, 4. Or in formulas, if you combine this equation here with this here, you get the following remarkable equation. Look at this. This will be the most important equation for us. And first, I want to convince now that this is a remarkable equation and that it is also a very hard equation. And that was why it took us 25 years to crack this equation. First, let's see why this equation is remarkable. What this equation is telling us is that no matter what the spectrum of your CFT is, no matter what the OPE coefficients of your theory are, if you have this horrible double sum over all delta and all L of these horrific functions, G delta L of UV, this double sum has to be equal to this double sum for all values of u and b. This is highly non-trivial. If you have, for instance, a CFT with 27 parameters, like coupling constants, etc., this equation should be true for any value of these 27 parameters. This is a very, very remarkable equation. 
This equation, on the other hand, is also very hard to deal with. For instance, one can see that the left-hand side is easy to expand around u equals 0 and v equals 1. This is the place where these two operators are very close. On the other hand, the right-hand side is easy to expand around u equals 1 and v equals 0. So there is no point in the UV plane in which both sides of the equation can be easily expanded. And that makes our life quite difficult. We are used to it, but anyway. Now, the, what people have done is to try to study this equation in different regions. In order to show you what the, what the relevant regions are, it is convenient to introduce these variables such as bar and 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. Now, in the Euclidean regime, if you have a four-point function in Euclidean space, then z bar is equal to c star, and we can study the previous equation around the point set z bar equals to one half. At this point, what happens is that both sides, sorry, both sides of the equation converge pretty well. None of them really well, but both of them pretty well. And you can study the equation uh, numerically. And this is the basis of the numerical bootstrap. On the other hand, if you are in the Lorentzian regime, then these two variables, C, Z and Z bar, they are two independent real variables, and there are more things that you can do. And in particular, you can consider and you can study the correlator in this point. So here, both U and V are very small, and this region here is the starting point of the analytic bootstrap. So, you may ask, so let me tell you, before proceeding, let me tell you at least intuitively why it is a good idea to study the bootstrap equation here. So, why is this a good idea? If you have a look at the full crossing equation, the full crossing equation can be seen as a relation between the direct channel and the cross channel. And in general, the interplay between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is extremely complicated. For instance, if you take one operator here, that one operator will map to a horrible infinite combination of operators on the right-hand side. And in general, it is very hard. In two dimensions, you have a finite number of operators. Well, in minimal models, you have a finite number of operators on both sides, so that's very easy. In higher dimensions, that's not true. And to analyze this equation is extremely hard. However, what we will see is that if one considers the limit in which u and b are small in this equation, only certain operators will survive on both sides. And rather than an infinite double sum mapping to an infinite double sum, we will have a much simpler map. And in particular, double twist operators with large spin, remember these first operators that I introduced here, these ones, they will simply map to the identity operator, while single trace operators with large spin will map to themselves. This very simple fact, well, it's not very simple, but this fact actually makes this crossing equation much more manageable. And that's basically the idea of the analytic bootstrap. The fact that you can take a limit of this equation in which this interplay between left and right simplifies enormously. Is that okay? Good. So, I am very sorry, I will punish you a little bit. In order to understand why this is the case, I have to tell you a couple of things regarding conformal blocks. So, conformal blocks, so the, the, we will need only a few things regarding conformal blocks. So, first of all, they are eigenfunctions of a quadratic Casimir operator. So, there is a second order operator in U and V, such that if you act on the conformal blocks with this operator, then that returns an eigenvalue that we denote by J squared. The form of this eigenvalue 
is not very important for us, but what it is important is that for large spin, this eigenvalue grows with L squared. In addition, these conformal blocks, they have a prescribed a small U behavior, and the small U behavior of conformal blocks is controlled by what is called the twist of the operator. The twist is the dimension minus the spin, and we see that G delta L UV goes to U to the tau over 2 times a function of V, which is sometimes denoted as collinear conformal block. This is true in any number of dimensions. In order to make this very explicit, we will introduce the following notation, when rather than G delta L, we use U to the tau over 2, F tau L. So we label now the primary operators by, by their twist and spin. In addition, these conformal blocks, they have a small V dependence that will also be very important for us, and they grow logarithmically with the spin. So they diverge, sorry, with, with the V. As V goes to zero, they have a logarithmic divergence. Now, with all this, armed with this uh, knowledge, since we are now experts in conformal blocks, let's try to see again at this conformal bootstrap equation. Here, I have, first of all, I have used this notation now. So I label the primary operators by tau and the spin. And I have also denoted the square of the OPE coefficients by A tau L. And now we do something. We will study the limit of this equation in which V is very small. So first, with mathematics, if you wish, you take V and you pass it to the other side, and then you take the small V limit. So if you do that, you get that the left-hand side has to be equal to u over v to the delta o from here, plus subleading terms as v goes to zero. This will be the rest of the operators, but they will have, if in higher dimensions, they will have some positive powers of v compared to this one here. And now we look at this equation, and we notice something very weird. We notice that the right-hand side diverges as a power law as v goes to zero. But I have just told you that each term on the left-hand side diverges only as a logarithm. So how can that be possible? The only way in which this is possible is if on the left-hand side we have an infinite number of operators. Any finite number of operators will not do. We need an infinite number of operators. So in order to reproduce the divergence on the right, we need an infinite number of operators with large spin and whose twist approaches to delta O, just by matching the powers of U on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Actually, since this function f has also higher powers of u, u to the 0, u to the 1, u to the 2, etc., and you don't see that on the right-hand side, you need an infinite number of operators whose twist approaches to delta O plus 2n, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. So, first surprise. In higher dimensions, you need an infinite number of operators. Any finite number will not do. It's not a surprise for many people here, but for someone who doesn't know CFT. Now, in order to understand how this can be possible, let's try to study the simplest example of a conformal field theory. And the simplest example, the simplest solution to crossing, is that of generalized free fields. Generalized free fields arise when you study large n conformal field theories in the limit in which n is equal to infinity. In that limit, <coughs> the four-point function is simply given by the sum of three disconnected pieces, and these are the three disconnected pieces. Then you can ask, what are the intermediate operators? In order to do that, you can do the conformal partial wave decomposition, and you see that the intermediate operators of this model 
are double twist operators, which are schematically of this form here. And they have twist equals to 2 delta O plus 2N, where O is the external operator. Notice this, for any value of the spin. They have the same twist for all spin, and they have some OP coefficients that can be computed from the conformal partial wave decomposition. Now, what is important about these OP coefficients is that the OP coefficients are such that if you plug them back into, into the conformal partial wave decomposition and you resum them, then they enhance the log divergence of a single conformal block into a power law divergence as b goes to zero. So, already in this very simple model, we see that there are OP coefficients such that if you resum an infinite number of conformal blocks, you reproduce this divergence here. But then we say, aha, but actually, this divergence is quite universal. It's not only there for generalized free fields. I have convinced you, I hope, that actually any conformal field theory should have this divergence. Because any conformal field theory has the identity operator. So, actually, we arrive to the following beautiful conclusion. And we arrive to the conclusion that in any conformal field theory, with O in the spectrum, crossing symmetry, together with the fact that the identity operator always appears in the OP of O with O, imply the existence of double twist operators with arbitrarily high spin and whose twist and OP coefficients approach those of generalized free fields. This is a beautiful result about the spectrum of generic conformal field theories, and we haven't assumed almost anything just crossing symmetry, OPE, etc. Under very general assumptions, we have already seen this. Now, what we would like to answer is the following question. Can we do even better than this? We, have, we see that then one way to rephrase this is by saying that all conformal field theories have a large spin sector for which the operators become essentially free. By that I mean they have the same twist and OP coefficients as generalized free fields. Now, can we do perturbations around large spin and compute these operators here? And the answer is yes. So the idea we would like to exploit in this talk is the following. We have seen that crossing symmetry implies that a conformal partial wave decomposition on the left is equal to something on the right that has enhanced divergences as v goes to zero. And here by enhanced divergences, I mean something that cannot be reproduced with a finite number of conformal blocks. For instance, a power law divergence. And then what we have seen is that the, the divergences on the right-hand side dictate what the behavior at large spin of the operators on the left-hand side is. And we have already seen that the presence of the identity operator on the right-hand side led to a remarkable result. So what we will do, we will try to take this idea to the next level. And one can solve a lot of problems, but just for this talk, we will solve the simplest problem. We will try to compute corrections to generalize three fields and see how we, we can use this method to, to compute these corrections. Are you okay? Yes? Good. So, sorry about this, but I need to introduce one last new ingredient uh, in order to do that. We have seen that generalized free fields has accumulation points in the twist. That means there is an infinite number of operators, and all of them have this twist, 2 delta O plus 2N, for any value of the spin. In such cases, it is convenient to define twist conformal blocks. What they give is the contribution to the four-point function from a given twist. Basically, these twist conformal blocks are the same 
they involve the same sums as the conformal partial wave decomposition, but you only sum over the spin. You don't sum over the twist. So they are the contribution from that twist tau. And we also define twist conformal blocks with this extra insertion of j to the 2m. Where, remember, this j squared was the eigenvalue of the quadratic Casimir operator. If you don't remember, this one here. These functions here, these functions here, I claim that they have very nice properties. So the first property, which is kind of obvious, is that the correlator, in this case generalized three fields, can be decomposed into these functions, h, tau, zero. This is kind of obvious because each of these functions gave the contribution from a given twist. So that if you sum over twist, you get the full four-point function, of course. Then they satisfy a very nice recurrence relation. Indeed, if you act with C, the Casimir operator, on both sides of this equation, you will see that on the left-hand side, you will produce an extra J square that will cancel two powers here. In other words, C acting on HM plus one produces HM. And this is a very nice recurrence relation. Then they have a prescribed behavior at a small u and a small v. This is very easy to see. This is a little bit less easy, but take my word for it that it is true. A nice thing about these functions is that actually, from all these properties, you can construct these functions systematically. For instance, as an expansion in a small u and v. This, even in cases in dimensions in which you don't know what the conformal blocks are, these sums actually can be constructed. So these sums, they have very nice properties. But then you would ask me, so what? I mean, who cares about this sum? So let's try to use these functions for something. And we will compute 1 over n corrections to large n conformal field theories or generalized free fields. So now, we assume that our correlator is the correlator of generalized free fields plus 1 over n square and some corrections which we are trying to find. Now, there are two sources of corrections here. The first correction is the fact that double twist operators themselves will acquire corrections. So now, their twist will be 2 delta O plus 2N plus some anomalous dimension of order 1 over N squared. And alike, the OP coefficients will be the OP coefficients of generalized three fields plus 1 over N squared times some corrections to the OP coefficients. In addition, we can also have new intermediate operators at order 1 over N squared and what the question we would like to answer is which corrections are consistent with crossing symmetry. So in order to answer that question, what we do, we look at the conformal partial wave expansion like this, and then here we plug this expression for the twist. And then we plug this here and we expand for a small 1 over n squared. If we do that, we see that the piece proportional to log u arises when you expand this u to the gamma over 2. And basically, the piece proportional to log u looks very much like the sums we have in the usual conformal partial wave decomposition with an extra insertion of gamma and L over 2. Is this clear? Yes? So what I am saying is that the log u arises only when you expand u. You plug this into here, and you expand this for a small 1 over n squared. And you can check this. But now, let's assume that this gamma and l admits an expansion in inverse powers of 1 over the spin, or more precisely, uh, powers, inverse powers of, of j, like this. This, I take it as an assumption, but actually it will be dictated by crossing. But let's say 
that this is true. And then if you take this expansion and you plug it here, you see that we recovered exactly the definition of our functions h. So the statement, so look at this, this functions h here. So the statement is that the piece proportional to log u of g1, the guy proportional to 1 over n squared, is a linear combination of these twist conformal blocks. And the coefficients of that linear combination are the same as the coefficients of the large spin expansion or large j expansion of the anomalous dimension. Now we are in a position to do the following. We now take this thing and we plug it into the crossing equation, which now has become this. But now something beautiful has happened. Because now both sides can be expanded around a small zero, around v equals zero. The right hand side, because it is the place where the right hand side converges very nicely, and the left hand side, because we have already done the sum over the spins. So now both sides can be expanded around v equals zero, and matching divergences on both sides, we can fix all coefficients v and m. In particular, this will give gamma and L to all orders in one over the spin. In other words, crossing equation has become an algebraic problem. Let's try to, this discussion is a little abstract. Let's see what we get in each of the cases. So let's discuss first the case number one. In the case number one, we assume that there are no new operators at order one over n squared. The right hand side, one can check that has no divergences as v goes to zero. And this implies that all functions h and m have to be absent on the left hand side. This arises from the explicit form of these functions h. In particular, this implies that for that case, gamma and L should vanish to all orders in one over L. On the other hand, truncated solutions in the spin are allowed, and these solutions were constructed many, many years ago by these people here. So for instance, one solution that you could have is, is a solution where gamma and L is different from zero only for a spin zero and is zero otherwise. So this will always be zero as an expansion in one over L. A more interesting example is an example where single trace operators do appear at order 1 over n squared. And a typical example is, for instance, the operator O itself. So now we are assuming that in the OPE of O with O, we have 1, we have the double trace operators, which are denoted by this, but then we have O itself entering at order 1 over n squared. Now the situation is much more interesting because the presence of this operator will give rise to this conformal block to the conformal block of the operator O on the right hand side, and this will produce divergences as V goes to zero. But now, with our trick, by, matching, by matching divergences on the right hand side, we can fix all coefficients B and M. And in particular, we can find gamma and L to all orders in one over the spin. For instance, the simplest example in which delta is equal to 2, we obtain this very beautiful uh, anomalous dimension here. And this may look like trivial, but actually this result, this problem hasn't been solved, wasn't solved for generic delta. So this method allows to find that solution. Now, let's, uh, so this, is, this shows, shows you how the method works in a very simple example. I will talk now about, about more generic conformal field theories and what are the results for more generic conformal field theories. First of all, let's try to have a wider look at generic conformal field theories. Actually, the additivity property that we have seen is a particular example of a more general one found by the same people. 
If two operators, O tau 1 and O tau 2, of twist tau 1 and tau 2, are part of the spectrum, then there is a tower of higher spin operators, of operator with higher spin, of twist tau 1 plus tau 2 plus 2n plus something that vanishes when the spin is very large. And I denote this double, trace, this double twist or double trace operators by this. Now, this statement, this additivity property, is something that should make you happy and sad at the same time. It should make you happy because it is a very nice result about the generic spec this spectrum of generic conformal field theories. It should make you sad because it also says that the spectrum of generic conformal field theories is extremely hard. For instance, if O is part of the spectrum, then O, O, and L, these double twist operators, also should be part of the spectrum. But if these guys are part of the spectrum, then the double twist of double twist should also be part of the spectrum. And so on. So, you see that a generic conformal field theory, just from crossing symmetry, and this very simple statement, should have all these infinite to the n, infinite to the infinite towers of, of, um, of operators. Then, you can ask what is the, the use of the method I have just described. Now, in non-perturbative conformal field theories, the spectrum is very rich. So naively, as we just claimed, so naively, it is hard to apply our idea. So you can have some left-hand side that you can write like this, but then on the right-hand side, in the cross-channel, you will have a very rich spectrum. And in particular, the structure of divergences, as v goes to zero, will be extremely complicated as well. However, it turns out that one can show although I haven't, I haven't proven it, that if you consider an operator O epsilon in the cross channel, this will give a contribution to the anomalous dimension of double trace operators that goes with one over the spin L to tau L, where tau L is the twist of this operator here. What that means is that actually, if you have control on the low twist spectrum of the theory, for instance, through the numerical bootstrap, actually, we can compute the leading terms in the 1 over L expansions of the anomalous dimension of double twist operators. Let me give you an example of a very non-perturbative conformal field theory. So an example of a non-perturbative conformal field theory is the 3D icing model. The 3D icing model has a spin operator, sigma, whose dimension is this, we write this as one half plus one gamma sigma. And then we have a tower of higher spin operators, which can be vaguely denoted by this. But actually, one can apply the method I just described, and one can predict that for large spin, the expansion starts like this. Now, the next corrections are very hard to compute, because one would need to know the full spectrum of the theory. And even on the right-hand side, even these operators themselves will enter. However, what we would like to claim is that these corrections are small for large spin. And the beautiful thing is that a spin equals 4 is already large. And you can, you can ask people from the numerical bootstrap to see which kind of results they get, and you can compare your results to your formula and here is the matching. So this line is the formula which I just described, and these are the results from the numerical bootstrap. So although we have assumed large spin and we don't have control, you see that it is already pretty good, even for a spin equals four. So this is quite, quite neat. So uh, I would like to make two important comments. So this also this allows for a very nice interplay, very powerful interplay between the analytic bootstrap and the numerical bootstrap. And also, I would like to mention that the convergence properties of all these series 
was established in a very nice paper by Karen Watt, and it was also understood there why all these series work so well. Now, in the last 10 minutes, let me, uh, let me mention three other directions. Now, if conformal field theories have a small parameter, then we are better off, because that small parameter further organizes the spectrum and organizes the problem, basically. And actually, the range of applicability of the method I just described is very vast, and you can use it for weakly coupled gauge theories, theories with weakly broken higher spin symmetry, and even 1 over n to the 4 corrections to generalize free fields. And in each, in each of these cases, the 1 over L expansions can be resumed exactly. So let me briefly describe each in 2-3 minutes these three developments. Let us, start, let us start with weakly coupled conformal gauge theories. Now, weakly coupled or gauge theories in general, they have these single trace operators with a spin, where you take the trace of two scalar operators with a change of derivatives. Their dimension, the dimension of these guys, grows logarithmically with the spin to all loops in perturbation theory. This is a highly non-trivial fact. If you do a one-loop computation, then you get that it is quite um, natural that they grow logarithmically. But if you do a two-loop computation, then they seem to grow like the square of the logarithm, and there are very nice cancellations that, tell you that actually made the growing just logarithmic. And if you go to three loops, it looks like it could grow like a log cube, but there are very nice cancellations and then even nicer cancellations of log square, and at the end of the day, you are left with a log L behavior. This was first a study by Gross and Wilczek. Now, we would like to be able to prove this from crossing. Why not? So, in order to do that, we can study the following correlator of trace of phi square in a weakly coupled gauge theory. And if you are in a weakly coupled gauge theory, these operators here they have twist equals to delta O, the dimension of this guy, plus something which is a small in perturbation theory. They are the leading twist operators in the theory, and we can focus in their contribution by taking the small UV limit. If you do that, I don't have much time to, to revise this, but actually the crossing equation looks like this, where now we need the sums on the left-hand side to reproduce the divergence on the right, and the sum on the right to reproduce the divergence on the left. Here, as v goes to zero, and here, as u goes to zero. So, as promised, single trace operators with large spin map to themselves. And matching divergences on both sides constrains the anomalous dimensions of these operators. We can ask what happens with the logarithmic behavior, so we can put an ansatz, we can propose an ansatz, where this gamma L is equal to some F log L plus A2 log square L plus A3 log cube L, and so on, it turns out that crossing symmetry to all orders in perturbation theory forbids any growing higher than log. So the claim is that the log behavior to all loops in perturbation theory for weakly coupled gauge theories in any number of dimensions follows from crossing symmetry as well. This is a nice result, I think. Now, let's discuss two more things. I, I try to be quick, but uh, clear at the same time. So, the one thing that we can also study, which is quite cool, are conformal field theories with higher spin symmetry. Now, if you are at the higher spin symmetric point, the theory contains a fundamental field, which, is, which has the free dimension, and this tower of higher spin conserve currents. Now, as you, as you break higher spin symmetry, the fundamental field and the currents acquire a small anomalous dimension. And what you can ask is which anomalous dimensions are consistent with crossing symmetry. And then you go and try to solve the problem, and it turns out that you can study the correlator of four fundamental fields and crossing symmetry for this correlator 
fixes fully the spectrum of your theory. For instance, if you have a scalar field around four dimensions, then you obtain this very nice result. The appearance of this, this actually is J squared for this problem, and the appearance of this is completely natural in the things we are doing. It's a lot of fun, actually. And we have studied several models, and again, crossing symmetry to the first non-trivial order fixes the spectrum. For Wilson-Fisher models around four dimensions, large n-critical ON models in dimensions between two and four, and also cubic models in around six dimensions. Let me uh, cover the last thing I wanted to say. As some people in the audience have discovered, it is quite nice, interesting, to study large N conformal field theories in D dimensions, because they may teach us about gravitational theories in ADS in one dimension further. For us, this, in the language of this talk, these are generalized three fields plus corrections. And it turns out that 1 over n corrections in conformal field, 1 over n square expansion in conformal field theory corresponds to a loop expansion in ADS, or adding powers of GM. For instance, <clears throat> you have that the correlator is equal to the sum of diagrams in ADS, so the generalized three fields is equal to the sum of three disconnected diagrams, that at order, then at order 1 over n square, we have these truncated solutions, we have these non-truncated solutions. But the thing is that diagrams in ADS are hard to compute. So now we can take an alternative route and study this by using crossing symmetry. For instance, we have already solved in the middle of the talk the answer for these two diagrams. Now we can even we can go even farther, and we can try to study loops in ADS. Loops in ADS are terribly hard to compute, and they are a largely an explored subject. But we can approach this by studying 1 over n to the 4 corrections to generalize three fields. And with the method I just described, it turns out that crossing conditions, cross consistency conditions, and crossing symmetry fix this gamma NL2 from the leading solution. And this, this is a quite uh, nice result. And even one can compute 1 over n to the 4 corrections to n equals 4 super Yanimils at a strong coupling. This is equivalent to computing loop corrections to supergravity on ADS 5 cross S5. So it is quantum gravity. For instance, just to show off a little bit, is if you can compute the dimension of the operator with little n equals 0 and spin 2, and it's just 6 minus 4 over n squared. This is the supergravity result. And at order 1 over n to the 4, we get this very beautiful 45. This, as far as I know, is the first non-protected quantity ever computed to this order in a DSCFT. Now, let me conclude. So we have seen that generic conformal field theories have a large spin sector which becomes essentially free, and we have shown how to perform a perturbation around that sector. The method applies to vast families of conformal field theories. It provides, in some cases, an alternative to Feynman diagram computations, no infinities, etc. It provides an on-shell gauge invariant way to study weakly coupled gauge theories. It allows to learn about loops in LES and quantum gravity, and it also allows connection with the numerical bootstrap because we have pushed it to finite spin. It is, this is just the beginning, and I would love to see where this is going. Thank you very much. Questions? Oh. Yes, sir. So you, you have shown how, how to compute the tree level and then loop correlators in ADS. Can the same techniques be used to compute correlators in DS, in the sitter? Ha. Huh. Uh, that would be very interesting. Um, <clears throat> in this case, the relevant CFT will not be unitary, right? 
Uh, one important point uh, about, about these analytic approaches is that we don't need the CFT to be unitary. So in principle, we don't have that obstacle because we don't need unitarity. And it is a very good question, actually. It's, uh, I would answer yes, but I haven't sit down and try to do it. So, yes. But I don't see any clear obstacles, actually, except I would have to learn a lot. Yes, but, but uh, yes, in principle, the lack of unitarity is not an obstacle. Oh. So, uh, can you say a few words about uh, these other limits where the twist is large, uh, but the spin is not necessarily large? Uh? Yes, absolutely. So, the, um, so, so let, me, let me, yes, so that, that is a, a very nice, very nice uh, subject on its own. So let me first tell, tell you one thing. I mean, in this, in, this, um, in this business, one of the things that we have achieved with this method was to compute this anomalous dimension, not only as an expansion in 1 over L, but also for all values of this little value N. So once you have resumed all the series in 1 over L, you can consider interesting limits. And it turns out sorry, let, let me let me come here. So we have extended the original results for the analytic bootstrap in two directions. So first we managed to resum in all all one over L, all the series in one over L, and also we have obtained results for any value of the twist. Once you have the result for all little n and all l, you can consider different limits. This limit is very interesting. And what happens is that one can, by alternative methods, one can compute what is gamma n l when n is very large. And it turns out that basically this behavior, well, this was a work by Shiboevo, Juan, and Simon Staffin, it turns out that this behavior, when n is large, has to do with the fact that these correlators, you can consider these correlators in the bulk, but there are points at which, sorry, you can consider these correlators in the boundary, but the fact that these correlators are dual to some bulk theory gives you extra divergences, which are not visible uh, just from the boundary, but they have to do with the fact that this little n is very large. It's a little bit technical to explain. I can explain a bit more if you want. But, but, uh, but the important point is that once you have expanded the Lycon bootstrap to both finite spin and finite n, you can take any limit you want. And the important point is that for questions like bulk, locality, etc., cetera, uh, this, this is important. Sorry, so, so let, let, that, that answer was not very nice. So correlators, they have what they are called Landau poles sometimes, where the distance among, among um, external points, they satisfy some conditions. And what can happen in, in theories with a bulk dual is that these Landau poles are inside the bulk, and you can see them by, by studying it. Is that more or less okay? You have a question? Is there any examples that uh, large, expansion, large spin expansion is not, not convergent? Oh, actually, um, yes, but they are not physical theories. So you, you could consider a theory. Uh, yes, so, so let, let me tell you, let, let me tell you, um, let me tell you a few things. That, that's a very, very important question, actually. Yeah. And it's asymptotic, mm -hmm. and we have all, always guessed the answer. But what, ha what can happen is that you can study the problem, for instance, in which you have exchange of one operator here. Mm -hmm. So this situation will lead to, a, to an anomalous dimension, gamma, which sometimes... So this is the case of O, of a phi cube theory. Mm -hmm. But if you consider the exchange 
of more generic operators, then this series in 1 over L are asymptotic. Mm. However, if you have a full theory, you cannot have the exchange of a finite number of operators. This is very similar to what happens in Regge. If you have the exchange of a single operator of a spin 4, that amplitude will not satisfy the Regge condition. But in a full, nice theory, you don't have that. You have a, an infinite set. So if you consider 1 over n to the 4 corrections to a full theory, such as n equals 4 uh, super Yanni Mills, then all these series are actually convergent. Okay. Uh, Hong, you have. Sorry. Is there any simple reason why that correction is all active? Uh, wh why? Sorry? Yeah, is there any simple reason why the correction you wrote there uh, is all active? Yeah, the, that, I, I don't understand the. Oh, yes, yes. Actually, yes, I didn't want to enter <laughs> much into that. Yes, there is a good reason. So. The, um, so th there are different, so people have studied different bounds and different things that this answer has to satisfy. Sorry, let, let me put here. That this answer has to satisfy, and one of them, it has to do with causality. And, and basically, causality is, um, I, I think, you can study this, this, this question for a general theory, and for a general theory, there are causality bounds that tell you that this correction actually has to be negative. Then, when you study theories <clears throat> like a single exchange, that, in principle, doesn't have to be true, because a single exchange is not a full theory, but it turns out to be, to be true nonetheless. But I would say that it is expected and has to do with causality. It, this is a causality in the bulk or in the boundary? Uh, in the bulk. So, so you say any simple boundary reason? Uh, uh, yeah, just from the bootstrap equation itself? <clears throat> yeah, I am not sure how to, how to understand this fully. It, it is expected, but ra rather than doing the computation and see that you get a negative answer, I, I, I don't have... Um, a very good answer to that question. I have to see, yeah, also in the numerical bootstrap, they have seen that basically the, the, the fact that these things, these corrections, have to be negative. But from the, from the boundary perspective and from the bootstrap equations, it's not at all obvious, at least to me, that that, that has to be uh, the case. Although it is quite expected and... and, and uh, but, but it's not obvious from the boundary point of view. You, you were mostly talking about CFT and dimension larger than two. What about d equal two and d equal one? Wow. Well, yes. So the, the reason why um, so the simple reason why I was talking about conformal field theories in dimensions higher than two is because if you are very attentive. Yes. You, you can see here that actually, if we are in two dimensions, then this tau here may actually be zero. So in order for this step to be true from here to here, we need a gap between the identity operator and the next tower of operators. Now, you can study generalized free fields in two dimensions. Of course, in two dimensions, you also have the Virasoro algebra and we will hear more about that. But in principle, if you study, you can also use only conformal symmetry, and most of the things I have said actually follow. And, and actually, all the results that I have shown, since they were the simplest, were results in two dimensions. So this is a result in two dimensions, and this is a result in two dimensions. But I am only using the conformal symmetry. About one dimension, uh, there is a similar comment for, for boundary, CFT, etc. To play this game, you need two cross ratios. And I, I'm not sure if you have only one cross ratio, how would you play the same game? Okay, um, 
Let's thank uh, Luis again for an excellent review.